future is to present the poly spin matrices in a way that's not quite as ad hoc. I like, I've been using that word a lot in these lecture series, ad hoc, but it's not in a way that's uh, uh, as sort of um, automatically just presented and immediately used, which is how it's generally done in uh, quantum mechanics courses. In other words, they say, oh, so now we're going to introduce the legendary, famous, well-known Pauli spin matrices. And then the next thing you see is, is this, ta-da, you know, the matrices. Then all of a sudden you start working with them. And what we're going to try to do with this lecture is derive them. You know, where did these guys actually come from and why are they the way they are? And this is not an easy task, actually, which is sort of why they're just sort of dropped into exposition without the full analysis sometimes, because it is actually uh, quite, a, quite a ride to get there. But it's totally worth it. And we're going to be using these things so much that uh, it's really good to get them solidly under our belt. Also understand that we're going to discover what a vector operator is in this process. And one of the vector operators we are going to discover is the Pauli spin <laughs> vector operator, where we now look at the Pauli matrices as the components of a vector. And it literally means a vector with the components each being a matrix, right? So sometimes it's written this way, but it has to be understood like this. And this structure here doesn't necessarily have to be a vector operator. Just because it is a um, three-dimensional column vector, which we would call using a, the notion of vector now is now a three-dimensional space vector, right? We're not talking about a vector space or a member of a vector space. We're now using the word vector to mean a column vector with three dimensions, right? Your standard three-dimensional vector. Um, a vector operator, it's more than just being a column vector with three dimensions. And we're going to specify exactly what we mean by vector operators. But it will turn out that this guy is a vector operator. Its components are operators, right? Where these are going to turn out to be re related to the spin operators. But the fact that it is a vector operator is unrelated to that. It's actually a, a different fact that we have to show. Anyway, we're going to go through all of that in this lecture. So let's begin this analysis with a little classical physics review. Let's consider a magnetic field, and it's uniform, and it's all headed in the direction of these arrows. And we will align our magnetic field with the z-axis, which is our sort of, that's characteristically how these problems are done when possible. It's a uniform magnetic field, and inside the uniform magnetic field, we are going to put a little magnet, right? And we know that this magnet will have a magnetic moment. And the mathematics of all this stuff is that the torque that that magnet feels, which is a vector quantity in classical physics, is the magnetic moment of the magnet multiplied by, well, not multiplied by, cross product with the V field. This is a vector equation, right? So this is a cross product. So if the magnetic moment is aligned with the magnetic field, you get zero torque. And if the magnetic moment is uh, not aligned, then this cross product will take some value and a, a torque will be applied. And um, that, uh, that torque is a measurable quantity. And this magnetic moment is a measurable quantity. So quantum mechanics will tell us that there must be, since this is a measurable phenomenon, that if this was a quantum mechanical system, this guy should be represented by an operator. And we can call that operator M. And we give M a little vector symbol, and that is because we know that being a vector, we should be able to measure the component of this magnetic moment in any direction we want. So we know that M is going to be related to MX, MY, and MZ, and those would all represent the different comp operators, the Hermitian operators that would represent the uh, uh, quantized version of the magnetic moment components in the x, y, and z direction. Now, if our 
little magnet here was expressed as some sort of quantum mechanical state, which I'll just arbitrarily call uh, uh, the state A, right? This is just a ket that represents the quantum mechanical state of this magnet. We're not talking about spin, we're not talking about angular momentum, just whatever, the total quantum mechanical state of this thing. Now it's in a uniform field, so it doesn't experience any forces, right? A magnetic moment in a non-uniform field will experience forces. That's the whole point of the stern gerlach experiment, where they use a very non-uniform field to separate spin components. But this is a uniform field, so there's going to be no acceleration or forces applied to the magnet. And uh, this is all sort of one big homogeneous space, so we don't care about its position. So we kind of are zeroing in on a state that really only describes its orientation relative to this field in the sense that it contains information about the magnetic moment. Now, it turns out that that will be information related to the spin, right? Because if it's not moving, it's not going to have any orbital angular momentum, which could generate a magnetic moment. But it does have intrinsic spin, and that intrinsic spin will have a magnetic moment. But that's a little bit down the road. Right now, I'm just interested in whatever description of its state we have. And we're going to call that description A. So we can now find the expectation value of, say, the x component of angular momentum by just calculating it, right? If we know A, we should, and we know mx. mx is an operator. This operator will act on the ket A, and we it's Hermitian operator because we've decided that these are observables, and that's our postulates of quantum mechanics. If you have observables, then Hermitian operators apply. So we can act on either the bra or the ket with mx because it's equal to its own adjoint. And we can calculate this number, which is the expectation value, given that the little magnet is in the state A, and uh, we know this magnetic moment operator. And likewise, we can do this for my and mz. And once we've done this, we can, you know, calculating expectation values is not the same as making a measurement. Remember, calculating the expectation value just tells us that if we did make the measurement of my many times, what is the average of those things going to be, right? And these expectation values do in the limit uh, uh, mimic classical quantities, which is what's important to us here. So now we're in this situation where we can calculate these expectation values because we know the state of the magnet and we know these operators, presumably. But there's an important point here, which is that if we now rotated the coordinate system, right, if we took the z-axis and, say, rotated it down here so it was pointing this way, and presumably if we did that, I think what would happen is then this would become the z-axis and this would become the x-axis. If, uh, if, I guess, if the y-axis went into the page. So we're really rotating around this y-axis, which is going uh, into the page. I guess into the page is an x, right? Yeah, I think I got that now. So the y-axis going into the page, we rotate around the y-axis, x becomes z. So if we were to do that, just to sort of move the shuttle this coordinate system around, what are we expecting should happen to these values? Because right? all we're doing is moving the coordinate system around. Now, there is this question of active versus passive rotations. This is a passive rotation because it's the coordinate system that's moving. We could have alternatively moved the B field from this, or we could have turned the whole system, right? We could have turned the B field and the magnet so that it was now facing the negative x direction, right? But uh, let's just consider it the passive rotation because passive rotation is obvious that None of the physics is changing, really. We're just changing the labels of things. So when we look at this, we know that, well, heck, uh, whatever used to be the expectation for value for z is now going to be the expectation value for x. And the expectation value for y isn't going to change at all. So, um, and then the expectation value for x, right, is going to uh, uh, be the uh, opposite of the expectation for value for z, because the old expectation for value for x was in this direction, 
So you would take Z and you'd flip it, right? Now that you've rotated the system. So the point is these guys here are going to be exchanged among themselves, but they're going to do so in a very, very predictable way. In fact, we can write that down because we know how to execute a rotation matrix in three dimensions. And in particular, the general matrix is this guy to rotate about the y-axis. And the way we did it, we chose this to be uh, 90 degrees. Right? So this would end up being, uh, so what would happen here? This would end up being 0, 0, 1, and minus 1. And what would happen is that mx prime, as we saw, would become uh, just 1 times mz. my would be equal to, oops, oops, obviously this 0 should be a 1, sorry. So my would stay as my, because there this because this row times that column would we'll just pull out my. And then mz would be minus 1 times mx. Okay, good. So we did it all right. So, so these expectation values, now we're talking about three dimensions, right? This is like regular sort of out there physics, right? Regular physics vectors. And all our uses of the word vectors are kind of going all over the place. But this is an instance where we're using the word vector to literally mean like your regular physics vector, right? And this is a regular rotation around the y-axis in three dimensions. It's a, there's three of these matrices, one for each axis, right? And this is the y-axis, because that's the rotation that we chose to experiment with. So, but there is a way of writing the general rotation that will be identified by a specific axis or three Euler angles. But in this case, we're just using this one for a nice simple example. But what we notice is that the expectation values of these three magnetic moment operators, when you rotate the coordinate system, they rotate into new values exactly the way you would expect any vector in three-dimensional space to rotate, right? This is, this could have been the, a position vector of some kind, and this would have been the rotation for the coordinate system. This doesn't have to be the case, right? These these could be three operators that are related to each other somehow, but the rotation in space doesn't literally transform these components into one another just like you would expect a regular vector. That doesn't have to be the case. When it is the case, when it is the case, we call the magnetic moment a vector operator. Where now the use of the word vector is really referring to a uh, three-dimensional space vector, right? So this is this word vector is so overloaded in this subject that it's 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 kind of crazy. So we can any vector operator, any vector operator can be rotated um, in this sense. Its expectation values can be rotated in this sense using the standard rotation matrices. Okay, so that's where this. That's a, that's a really important point, and that's where we're going to start our analysis. And uh, the next step is to take these rotation operators and understand a little bit how they relate to our spinners. All right, so this slide will now tell us how we get from our Dirac formalism into our spinner formalism, where we're using the spinner language where chi is C1, C2, that's our spinner, right? So that still counts as the two component formalism. If we just name the two component object with the letter chi, we're still in the two component formalism. We're just using a shorthand. Again, it's another form of shorthand in the mix of all this. It clearly is not the same as this broquette formalism. And from time to time, we can mix freely between the two, right? And if we wanted to identify this component, like I said before, we could actually subscript this um, if we needed to. So we, we would say, for example, C1 is chi A or something. The point is, is that we are, this is the two component formalism because these, these, uh, these symbol, these chi's represent our, our stand-ins for 
a, a, a column vector, a two-dimensional column vector. So this immediately translates into this. This is an expectation value, which is a real number for this vector operator. And this is the same thing. This is a real number, this is the expectation value of the operator AX between the states given in the two-component formalism by chi. So chi on the right, chi adjoint on the left, real number. Same for all three of these components. And we know that uh, the rotated version of this is going to be expressed through a simple combination of these three numbers via a rotation matrix. And that rotation matrix will depend on the direction of the rotation or the ax the sort of the axis of rotation and the amount of angle that is rotated. And in three dimensions, we know what these rotation matrices look like. There's all of the, uh, the, the thing to study, if you want to get to the weeds of it, is Euler, uh, the Euler rotations, because that's how you build the rotation matrices using the Euler angles. And there's another way of doing it, but the Euler angles is probably the most, uh, most well uh, explained, meaning it's almost in every good book on, on the subject, mechanics or quantum mechanics. So, so we know how to get at this, but look at the way I wrote this. I wrote this component down, chi prime, I'll put that in parentheses, adjoint, ax chi prime. And what I'm saying is that, what I'm tr saying with this notation here, we, we kind of did it up here too with this prime. Prime says, hey, take that old expectation value. There's some new expectation value, which I'll identify somehow with a little prime. And that new expectation value is derivable from these three old ones through this matrix. But here, and likewise here, but here in particular, what I'm saying now is, you know what? There's some other spinner state out there where if I take the expectation value of this operator, the X component, the expectation value of the X component of this operator, I'm going to get a number, and I'm going to get a real number, and that real number is going to be the same real number I would have gotten had I taken the three old expectation values and executed this rotation matrix to find this first component. So the question is, is what state is that? Because if I knew what state this was, if I knew what state x chi prime was, I wouldn't need this rotation matrix. I wouldn't need these old values. I would just immediately... Uh, calculate chi prime, presumably I know chi, and now I would need to, if I could figure out what chi prime was, then I could immediately calculate this expectation value directly. So what gives? Well, there's actually two ways of looking at this, right? First of all, we know, you know, being vector spaces and linear and everything, we know chi prime, there's some operator out there that if it acts on chi, is going to give me chi prime. And that operator I'm going to call u. And u is a way of thinking about the rotation operator in three dimensions of a spinner. Right? So you have this spinner object, chi is c1, c2, two complex numbers. What does it mean to rotate chi in three-dimensional space, right? I can understand how to rotate any vector or vector operator in three-dimensional space. That kind of makes sense, right? I got the Euler angles to play with, or I could just say, hey, let's rotate around the z-axis only. And I kind of know what's going to happen. I've got a good geometrical intuition here. But this thing, this is a very abstract object, right? It doesn't live in three-dimensional space, right? You can't kind of lay it down on some sort of three-dimensional grid, but we can still talk about its rotations in three-dimensional space because, because we can define the rotation of this object to be that spinner which returns these three components as if the original bunch of components was just mixed together through a real intuitive rotation in three-dimensional space. So that's what we're trying to find out. We want to find out what operator will take chi and give me chi prime such that chi prime gets right at this component instead of having to go through all of this, right? And that is what we mean by rotating a spinner 
in three-dimensional space. We're kind of linking it. We're kind of linking the rotation of a spinner in 3D space to the normal notion of rotating a vector in three-dimensional space. But we're playing around now with vector operators. So now I've replaced, you know, we're dealing with a general vector operator, AX, not specified. All we know is that it is a vector operator. We know it's a vector operator because it obeys this rule. And now we're going to kind of think about this chi prime thing and look for U that um, uh, gives us these equivalent numbers uh, by rotating the state itself and then recalculating the expectation value. So I guess we would have to do one rotation of the state to get chi prime, and then three expectation value calculations, as opposed to one matrix multiplication of a three by three matrix on a, uh, a three-dimensional column vector. So, but the, the win we get is we understand what U is all about, all right? So let's tackle how to rotate spinners in three-dimensional space. So the first thing to notice is we are after a two by two matrix because that's the only way to make a linear transformation of a uh, two dimensional column vector. And the other thing that we notice is that if I call this guy, if I call that chi and I call this chi prime, I know that chi adjoint chi equals one because our spinners are normalized, right? Our state space is normalized. Whatever this rotation operator is, I'm expecting chi prime to retain its normalization. So I'm expecting chi prime adjoint chi prime to equal one. But I also believe that chi prime equals this operator u, which or this matrix u, times chi with matrix multiplication. And I also believe that chi prime adjoint, right, which equals u chi adjoint, which is going to then equal chi adjoint u adjoint, right? So with this in mind, I now know that I can write this chi prime adjoint chi prime as chi adjoint u adjoint u chi, right? Because this is chi prime adjoint and this is chi prime. But if this guy equals one, I know this equals one. And the only way that equals one is if u adjoint u is equal to the identity matrix. And this condition is called unitarity. And we say U is unitary, right, unitary. Another way of writing unitary is U adjoint equals U inverse. It's also true, by the way, that in case you were wondering, U, U adjoint also equals the identity. So this is an important constraint on chi, right? It's unitary, right? So step one, this is a unitary matrix. So keep, and the unitary is defined this way. And we're going to use that in a moment to uh, really start zeroing in on what U is going to be like. So this process of attacking the nature of U, it goes the same as we've done for a lot of things. We did this, I, I think we might have even done this for rotations before in an earlier lesson under a different context. But we always start with an infinitesimal rotation, and then we build it up by doing successive infinitesimal rotations for a finite rotation using exponentiation of these operators. So how is this going to work for our rotation? Well, our rotation operator, our infinitesimal rotation operator, is, well, I guess our finite rotation operator, right, is going to look like u is going to be the identity, because if there's no rotation, we know it's going to be the identity. So if epsilon is the amount of rotation, when epsilon is 0, this thing better be the identity. So it's the identity plus, and if epsilon is the amount of rotation and n is the axis of rotation, right? We know it's got to depend on the axis of rotation. We know it's got to depend on the amount of rotation. But remember, this has to be a two by two matrix, a two by two matrix. So we have to somehow convert this axis into a two by two matrix. So the 
only way to turn it into one two by two matrix is to take each component of this axis and multiply it by some two by two matrix and add them all up so that this result is a two by two matrix. So what we do is we consider a vector of two by two matrices, which we're gonna call sigma uh, with a, an arrow on top, which I suppose is the vector symbol. It's a vector, it's a column vector of where each element of the column vector is a two by two matrix. And then when we dot it into N, we will end up with a two by two matrix here, which we can add to the unit two by two matrix, and then U will be a two by two matrix. And we can continue to do this for higher orders too. We just square epsilon, square this thing, you know, divided by the appropriate factorial. We just do it on forever. But uh, we're gonna ignore all the higher order terms because epsilon is now gonna be an infinitesimal rotation. Now, be very careful. The way I'm presenting it here is different than you'll ever see in any other book. And the reason is in every other book, you're gonna see an I and a two, right? An imaginary, the, uh, uh, the imaginary unit and divide by two. And that's all for later convenience. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the most obvious thing, right? And this is the most obvious thing. You're adding a little bit of a matrix to the unit matrix. And then I'm gonna show later why we introduce the I and the, and the uh, one half. You're gonna see in the end why those things are good. Actually, you're gonna see one right away and then you're gonna see the other one at the very end. And then, because I don't, I don't like in these expositions to have these convenience factors, I'd rather see what happens without them and then put them in and be happy that I understand exactly their origin. That's just the way I like to do it. So the um, Hermitian conjugate of U the Hermitian conjugate of the unit matrix is this, it's itself. This guy, I told you, is a two by two matrix. So it can be, and it's comp, you know, it, it's going to be complex. So it can have a, um, uh, it can, it can have an adjoint. So this adjoint is, um, is the only relevant adjoint right there. And then these other terms we, we ignore. Then I'm going to use the unitarity condition. Right? The unitarity condition tells us that if I multiply these two together, I should get one. So when I multiply this times this and ignore the higher order terms, I should get four terms when I do this, but one is going to be a higher order term. So there's only three terms left, and these are the three terms that are left. Right? And this does not equal one. So what we have to decide is if this is going to represent an infinitesimal rotation, then this has to somehow cancel. This has to cancel with that. And that actually is a condition on the Hermitian, this, the, the uh, uh, adjoint of this matrix. So if you take a look, what is this guy? What is n dot sigma? Well, the, it's the x component of n times the sigma x matrix. Remember, this is three different matrices. This is the y component of n with the sigma y matrix, the z component of n with the sigma z matrix. So this is a two by two matrix, a two by two matrix, a two by two matrix. So the sum is a two by two matrix. And the adjoint of that is just gonna be the adjoint of this sum, which is gonna be the sum of the adjoints. And therefore, we can really write this as n dot the adjoint of this vector, right? So that's how we that's how we sort of write it down. But the point being is that for this to cancel with this, the adjoint is going to have to equal the opposite of the original vector, right? If I could replace this sigma adjoint with minus sigma, then this and that will cancel. So the only way this works as a rotation is if these sigma matrices are anti Hermitian or anti Hermitian. If this was a plus, right? If I could, if I, if that was plus, then it would be Hermitian, but it's not. It's anti Hermitian. And in fact, mathematicians, when they study this kind of stuff, they're happy with that. That's the way they like it, anti Hermitian. But we physicists aren't happy with that at all because everything in quantum mechanics, the axioms are all about Hermitian operators, right? Our measurements don't yield complex values, they yield real values. So we want this condition not to be anti-Hermitian, we want it to be Hermitian. 
So physicists go back to the beginning and say, okay, okay, how can I kludge this in order to make this Hermitian? Well, the first thing I'll do is I'll make this a minus and I'll add an I. If I make that a minus and add an I, what happens? Well, then the unitary part, that minus I becomes a plus I, like that, that's good. And then um, when you finish the multiplication, then the minus sign will appear here, right? The minus sign will appear right here. That plus will end up becoming a minus. And uh, I can't forget that there'll be an I here and an I here, right? And now this will cancel with this, not if it's anti-Hermitian, but if it's Hermitian, right? So now we get our condition. So that is the origin of the I in this unitary operator. It's completely, entirely there because we want the condition to be hermeticity. And it's not a problem because these are complex matrices. So having an I, a factor of I there is really no big deal. It's not like you're changing the nature of this thing very much because the, the components of this thing, we're going to have to figure out. We still don't know what the components of this thing are. We know that there's three of them because that's the only way that this can turn into a two by two matrix because that's a vector. So we know there's three. In fact, the dimensionality of the space tells us how many of these matrices there are. And that's an important point because when you get into quantum field theory, um, turning these objects inside these unitary, infinitesimal unitary matrices, turning them into the right kind of structure dictates how many gauge bosons there are in your situation, right? It's really kind of interesting. Okay, but that aside, uh, so now we have the I, and we're going to keep the I in for the rest of this thing. We've, that, that convenience factor has been put in. There's still a convenience factor of one half that I have not put in yet, right? So we'll see when that shows up later. All right, now we're going to go back to this for a second, and let's just blow up the formula just for this one guy. And what we're going to get is we're going to get chi prime adjoint ax chi prime equals r11, and now I will just finish it out. This term here is just r11, r12, r13 times this uh, column vector, right? So this is a real, these are real numbers because this matrix in rotation in three-dimensional space, it's a real matrix. It's actually a member of the group called SO3 for what it's worth. But um, uh, this guy here, that sum is equal to this thing over here. Now, all these real numbers and all the linearity allows me to rewrite this in a much simpler form. And knowing that chi prime equals our mysterious rotation matrix for spinners times chi, I can use these two facts to simplify this. And I'm going to do that now. Uh, oops, for some reason I wrote ax several times here, but obviously this should be ay and az. I uh, did it correctly here. So now notice what I've done is I pulled out the chi and the chi adjoint outside everything. And it just comes in by linearity. R11 is a number, so it just blows right through that. And then you get chi adjoint, chi ax, which is what that is, a y and a z likewise. So now I have this expression. And you can kind of see that um, I can simplify this by just getting rid of the chi's, because both sides are being multiplied by chi adjoint on the left and chi on the right, right? So I end up with this expression here. Right? I end up with whatever my mysterious U is, U adjoint, which is a two by two matrix operating on AX, right? which is also a two by two matrix, otherwise this could not be a number, a real number. And, um, and U, uh, uh, the same mysterious matrix multiplies on the right. So that's just a triple matrix multiplication. Um, and then over here, I just have these two by two matrices, AX, AY, and AZ, being multiplied by three different real numbers. So, and then I can create this formula three times, right? I can do it for AY and AZ, so I can create this formula three times. 
So this formula is what I'm going to use to really attack what u is. And remember, u is the notion of rotating um, uh, chi to the rotated spinner chi prime through by bootstrapping this notion of a vector operator using a regular rotation in three-dimensional space. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by just attacking this, u adjoint axu. Now we have our form for u, right? Our provisional form for u. Now ultimately, remember, there's going to be a, this guy's going to be over 2 in the end. Kind of fun to watch, right? I haven't put the over 2 there, uh, or, I, or I haven't drawn in a factor of 1 half yet, right? There should be, this whole thing should be over 2, right? But I haven't included it yet. And... Um, it's interesting to see how's that going to affect it in the end if you want to keep track. But it, you don't have to, right? Um, but anyway, this formula here is going... I'm going to take this, find the adjoint, which changes that minus to a plus, and then changes this sigma to a sigma adjoint, uh, ax, and then uh, I, I just take this as is and put it on the right-hand side. And then I multiply through... Well, first thing I realize is that sigma adjoint and sigma are the same because it's Hermitian, right? So I can get rid of that adjoint indication, right? That adjoint can go away because we know sigma is Hermitian from our previous work. Now, just for the purposes of this exercise to understand what we're doing, we're going to simplify things and we're going to take, basically we're going to take n, right? n is a vector and we're just going to say n is n z z hat, right? N it, and and z to be normalized because n is supposed to be a unit vector, it's just going to be z hat. So that means that n dot sigma is just going to be sigma z, right? Sigma z. It's a it's a two by two matrix sigma z. So that's the simplification. We're just considering a rotation about the z axis. We're considering a rotation only about the z axis. And that didn't, was not requirement. I'm not doing that because the eigenvectors are aligned with z. I'm not doing it. I could have done this with x or y just as easily. And in fact, you really do end up having to do it with all three of the axes, right? So if you want to get at sigma z, you've got to do it to sigma z. If you want to get at sigma x, you've got to do it for sigma x. So we're just going to start by with sigma z. And um, this, so this is the replacement for this n dot, for this uh, dot product here and this dot product here is just sigma z now. And then you just execute the multiplication, right? It's, it's, it's uh, these are matrices, right? Or operators or matrices, but in our poly two component formalism, which is what we're in, this is a four by four matrix and this is a, I'm sorry, a two by two matrix and this is a two by two matrix. And just because we're not explicitly writing them as two by two matrices, we know that that's what these are. Therefore, we are in the poly two component formalism. So I multiply through linearly. Everything is linear. Boy, linearity makes it all possible, right? Um, and I get AX plus I epsilon sigma Z AX. And then I have to do one more multiplication. And when I do, I end up with three terms that are first order and then one term that is fourth order, which I skip. And now I have AX minus I epsilon ax sigma z plus i epsilon sigma z ax and there's no since they don't commute these are i can't just cancel these terms right these terms do not cancel so that is what this term is and this term was derived from the idea of chi prime adjoint ax chi prime so this term was derived from the notion of rotating the spinners right that's that's how we ended up with that this this thing to cap uh, with the motivation to calculate this thing. So now, but we also have the rule about the rotation of the um, uh, of of the vector components of the vector operator, and this is our infinitesimal rotation around the z-axis by an angle of epsilon. And we can execute this really trivially, and we just get ax minus epsilon ay, right? And uh, actually, um, to be clear, if you multiply this whole, 
I'm sorry, if we multiply this whole thing out, you'll end up with another vector. We're only multiplying this first row, so I, I really should indicate that uh, what we're really doing here is we're multiplying this guy by this guy to get this, right? Because this is only the first component. Let me go back to, to this story. Whoops, not there. Here, right? We're calculating just this component. So that's the first uh, row of this times this column vector, right? And that's what this is, right? So this really isn't, it isn't those. It's just this row and this column. And that gives you this. That's why you don't see any AZ there, right? If you had done a full matrix, you would have gotten three components. All three of them each would look like this, but this is a, this is just a single operator. So uh, this equal sign is not appropriate is what I guess what I'm getting at. I guess what I should do is I'll make it an arrow. From this process, we derive AX minus epsilon AY, right? Well, you know what? I, 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 I want to keep those equal signs. So here's what I'm going to do. All right, there. Now I've got it, now I've got it right. This matrix multiplication gives you this. But, but this here is just equal to this first component, right? And that's what this thing down here says, right? This part here is uh, U adjoint AXU. Right, that's what this is. This is this uh, left-hand side, and this right-hand side is the first component up here. Okay, phew. So now, once we've done that, you know, the AXs cancel on both sides, right? The epsilons cancel on both sides. Then I am left with sigma Z AX on the left side and AX sigma Z, because that minus sign, so I just sort of flip them to make them look like a commutator will look. And what's left over here is AY, which is got, it's carrying a minus sign, but I divide through by I to get rid of the I, and so I get um, I AY. So this commutator, sigma Z AX equals I AY. Now that missing one half I kept telling you about, the one half that should go up here in the, or should go here in the denominator, had we kept that one half, if that one half was there, it would have been two i a y, right? But it's not, it's just i a y without it. Now you repeat this process for the other, these other two, right? You repeat it for this and you repeat it for this. And you end up with these other commutators and that's all based on a rotation matrix, infinitesimal three-dimensional rotation matrix around, over the z-axis, around the z-axis. So I can derive these commutation relations between sigma z and ax by, um, uh, through an infinitesimal rotation around the z-axis. And that's, a, that's a, actually a lot of information. It doesn't really tell me anything. Remember, AX is arbitrary, so I got no information from that. I don't know anything about the matrix elements of AX. All I know is that AX is a vector operator. But now I know that if AX is a vector operator and sigma Z is going to be the operator up here that tells me how these infinitesimal unitary operators work to transform spinners, if sigma is going to be that thing, then I know that the Z component of sigma must satisfy these commutation relations with respect to any vector operator out there. So that's actually quite a bit of a constraint on sigma Z. Still doesn't give us the components, but it's a constraint. Now I can repeat this with an infinitesimal rotation around X. Like I said, I have to do it for all of them. And I get these commutation relations, right? And they're, you know, they're structurally the same, but you know, we, it's X is now, Z is now replaced with uh, X, and X is replaced with Y, and Y is replaced with Z, right? It's sort of a cyclic thing, but they're the same structure. And then I do it in the third, uh, around the third axis, and I get these commutation relations. So this is the link. This analysis here is the link between the structure of the infinitesimal rotation of a spinner to the structure of the 
infinitesimal rotation of a vector operator. And it's through these expectation values that we define how a spinner will rotate or, or, or how we, what operator we need to rotate a spinner, right? So, um, so now uh, we need to keep pushing. We need to still figure out what are these matrices? Because once we know these matrices, we're good because then we just exponentiate everything. And I would get exponential minus I epsilon N dot sigma, right? And I know how to exponentiate a matrix because it's just the Taylor series with a matrix thrown in there by definition. And I know that this is a finite rotation. So I can even get rid of this epsilon and replace it with a finite angle theta, right? And now I got my finite rotation. So it all is hinging on figuring out sigma. So what can we do to figure out sigma? We've got all these nice commutation relations now, and we um, uh, have to now work on the next step. Well, the next step requires an important observation. This operator sigma, right, or this uh, vector of, of uh, two by two matrices, it in itself is a vector operator. First of all, it's a two by two matrix, right? So, you know, you have sigma one, one, sigma one, two, sigma two, one, sigma two, two. It's a two by two matrix. Ergo, it serves as an operator because two operators on our spinner two, two component formalism are two by two matrices. But more importantly, it's actually going to be a vector operator. And here's how we know. We know because chi prime, the so-called rotated vector, this is now the infinitesimally rotated vector uh, of chi. So somehow this guy represents a rotation about the axis n of a small amount epsilon of the spinner chi. And uh, so this is me just substituting in this infinitesimal form of u. Right, so this is nothing more than the definition of what u is supposed to do. But if I multiply on the left by chi adjoint, I get chi adjoint chi prime, which is not chi adjoint chi, it's chi adjoint chi prime. So it's the adjoint of our original spinner times the rotated spinner. But I also multiply on the left here by chi adjoint. And when I expand it out, I get chi adjoint chi, which we know is 1 as this is normalized. But then the chi adjoint kind of slips in on the left and the chi slips in on the right and surrounds this operator, this vector operator, right? So what that means is that this is a number and this is a number. This has to turn out to be a number, right? It's no, because this is sort of the expectation value of an operator, right? This has to be an, but this is a vector, right? This is, this, this sigma is, is really a vector of three two by two matrices. So this has to end up being a vector that can, of, that can be uh, dotted into a normal vector to give a number. And the only way that's possible is if this itself is a vector operator in the sense of what we were talking about um, back here, right? In this sense, right? If I replaced AX with sigma X, sigma Y, and sigma Z, and sigma X, and sigma Y, and sigma Z, then this property holds, right? because this guy here has to be a vector of, of a normal vector in order to be dotted into n. So for this whole thing to work, sigma must be a vector operator. And what that tells me is I can go to these commutation relations here, and everywhere I see an ax, I do what I just did a moment ago, I replace it with sigma x, replace it with sigma y, I replace it with sigma z, and I'm choosing one particular vector operator that I know I want to know about. And I put it right in there. And I end up with these commutation relations for 
the sigma matrices. And that is based on the principle that sigma itself has to be a vector operator. In order for n dot something to be a number, which is what it has to be, that n dots, it must be dotted into a vector. Ergo, that's a vector operator. And so I end up with these commutation relations. Now, just to foreshadow, had I kept the one half in this story, right? Had I put a one half there, based on my calculations, this would have been a two, a two, and a two here, right? But we didn't put the one half in, so those twos are not there. Okay. So now we have these commutation relations, which should start looking really familiar, right? These commutation relations are looking a lot like the commutation relations of angular momentum. So now our next step is to start figuring out what we can about the actual matrix elements for these sigma matrices. Now remember when we started with our spinner, we defined it with two complex numbers, C1 and C2, and these were understood as C1 is the um, uh, probability of finding the spin aligned in the positive, uh, the positive z direction, and then the spin counter aligned. It's the m equals plus one half h bar eigenvalue and the m equals minus one half h bar eigenvalue, but it's with respect to the z axis. So we've already set this thing up here to be aligned with the z axis. And the reason that's important is because any rotation around the z axis should not affect this at all. Right, and that means that any rotation around the z-axis is uh, ultimately must be a diagonal matrix, right? Because it can't change these 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 numbers, right? It might change the phase of C one and C two. It, it could it doesn't mean that it has to be the uh, identity, but it does have to uh, carefully make sure that these moduli squared don't change. So we can say that U z is diagonal, and what's important about that is that um, if it's 1 minus sigma z, then sigma z has to be diagonal also. So sigma z must be a diagonal matrix. I, I wrote down, uh, I wrote this down funny, right? What I want to say is like uz has got to be diagonal. So let's just say it's you know d1 and d2. And it implies sigma z must be diagonal, right? So then... This should be sigma z down here, right? And then we also know that if we go to the commutation relations that we derived on the previous page, if we take the trace of this commutator between sigma x and sigma y, we know that the, it equals i sigma z, because that was the relationship we were able to derive from that whole previous analysis. Well, we know that the trace of i sigma z is going to be zero because traces are unaffected by commutation regardless of whether the matrices are the same the trace of these products will be the same and this is going to be zero so we know that the trace of z is zero so we know that sigma z has to have some structure lambda and minus lambda right that's the only structure it can have it can have a phase though there could be an e to the i phi here some phase factor that won't affect ultimately will not affect uh, these values up here. But we're just going to uh, set that phase factor to one right now, right? But there is, there's always in quantum mechanics this idea of this phase indeterminacy, but that's not for us to worry about right now. So then we're just gonna use all of our tricky little algebraic techniques uh, that we cleverly worked out in the past. And we're gonna create sigma plus, which is sigma x plus i sigma y, and sigma minus, which is sigma x minus i sigma y. And then we're gonna derive the commutation relations, sigma z and sigma plus. And I'll just do a couple, one out for you. Sigma z, sigma plus is sigma x plus i sigma y, everything's linear. So it's the commutator of sigma z with sigma x, and the commutator of sigma z with i sigma y, and the i comes out linearly. So you have this commutator plus i times that commutator, which this commutator is i sigma y, and this commutator is minus i sigma x. And then when you get all the i's straight, you end up in the end with uh, sigma plus. You end up with sigma x plus i sigma y. You end up with sigma plus. 
If you do the whole process again with sigma minus, you know, defined this way, you end up with minus sigma minus, which is interesting. And then the commutator of sigma plus with sigma minus is 2 sigma z. I can't help but point out that if we had put that one half in our definition up here, right, if that one half was there, then these numbers would not come out the same. This would have been a 4, this would have been a minus 2, and this would have been a 2, right? But we did not use that convention, so we do not get those 4s and 2s. We just get a 2 here, but no... We, instead of a 4, we get those 2s there. Okay, so now, knowing all of this, what we are going to do is we're going to take, we're going to try to solve for sigma plus. We're going to call sigma plus A, B, C, D. Each matrix element is unknown. Sigma Z, we're on, we, we don't know those matrix elements either, but we do know that they're the same, that, that they can be expressed with one parameter, lambda. You've got lambda and minus lambda. So you've got A, B, C, and D for sigma plus. And then we're going to run this commutator, sigma Z, sigma plus, equals sigma plus. So sigma Z, sigma plus, minus sigma plus, sigma Z. And we, if you do that calculation, if you calculate these two matrix elements, you get, you know, you get, you can see lambda A, uh, for the first element, and then you get uh, minus lambda c down here, right? This times that will give you this minus lambda c. And if you just execute this, you end up with lambda a, lambda b, minus lambda c, minus lambda d, minus lambda a, minus lambda b, lambda c, minus lambda d. And when you add those two together, the diagonal elements cancel. Lambda a cancels with lambda a, minus lambda d, minus, minus lambda D, and you end up with 2 lambda B and minus 2 lambda C is um, the result of the commutator. And then the uh, lambda plus, remember it's lambda Z, the commutator of, of sigma Z and sigma plus is equal to sigma plus. So this thing here, which is the result of the commutator, must equal sigma plus. And the only way that works is if A and D are both equal to zero. And then you can choose. You can say, well, if lambda is one half, then this element equals B. So that's good. But then C has to be zero. Or you could choose lambda to be minus one half, in which case um, B has to be zero. And uh, C gets, to, uh, and 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 then this will end up being C. Actually, it doesn't matter which one you choose, but we're going to choose lambda equals one half and C equals zero. And now, if we know if we do that, we've got those two are zero. We've got C equals zero. We've got lambda equals one half, right? So now, how do we do this calculation? Lambda equals one half. Sigma plus is just B. We know that sigma plus adjoint is sigma minus, so the adjoint of this is the transpose conjugate, so it's B star. And then I go to the other con uh, relationship we know. We know the, the commutator between sigma plus and sigma minus is 2 sigma z. And if I do that calculation, I find sigma plus sigma minus, minus sigma minus sigma plus. It equals B, B conjugate in the uh, first position, and minus b, b conjugate in the second position, and 2 sigma z, well, lambda is a half, so I got 1 half and minus 1 half times 2, so I know b, b conjugate must equal 1. And so sigma plus is now got this form, sigma minus now has this form, sigma z now has this form. I know that sigma plus and sigma minus can be combined to form sigma x, and when I do, I get this, and I can combine it to get sigma y, and when I do, I get this. And now I have all three of my poly matrices. Phew. And um, this now is a bit of a problem because I'm sure you all know that the poly matrices don't have one halves in them. They have one, 
minus 1, 1, minus 1, and it's just i, and minus i and i, right? It doesn't have these one-halves in it. And of course, that's exactly the reason why, back in the beginning of this nonsense, we throw in uh, an over 2 right here, right? And if you do that, and you follow this exercise all the way through to the end, you get the poly matrices that we actually know and use. Just, just like this. Okay, that was a long lecture to get to this point, but uh, totally worth it. Now you understand the exact origin of the poly matrices. The big key, the big key is that the rotation of a spinner is really driven by the idea of rotating a vector operator, right, and finding the equivalent spinner state that duplicates the rotation of a vector operator in regular three-dimensional space. All right, so next time we will uh, take up another topic in this and uh, keep moving on with our prerequisites. Thanks for listening. I'm sorry it was a long lecture, but I think we covered the total thing as thoroughly as we can. Uh, see you next time. Oops, I guess I should write the final versions of everything with all the conventions in place, right? This is for the infinitesimal, and this is for the, uh, the finite rotation operator. Okay. <laughs> um, and this one-half, of course, is the legendary one-half that makes the spin one-half rotations uh, not come back to the same value through, one, through two pi of an angle, right? You need four pi to come back. But we'll talk about that eventually later. Okay. Thanks. Bye.